Welcome to Amateur Logic TV, episode 43. I'm George. And I'm Jim. I'm Tommy. And I'm Peter. And we got a great show lined up for you tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. You may notice the little official Amateur Logic TV sign here out front. That is courtesy of our good friends at gemsengraving.com. Check it out. He's got a lot of great things there. We've got this old tube. It's a little warm. <laughs> But uh, uh, we really appreciate that, Jim. It makes a fine prop for the set here. Not me, Jim, by the way. That... Not not this Jim. <laughs> the real Jim's engraving. Yeah, so the, nice. uh, the uh, LED lights get that thing a little hot after a little while, eh? Uh, actually, I was just faking it. Ah, okay. But it changes colors. You know, we, we've got a lot of different colors we can do with it, as long as I stay away from green because <laughs> it'll disappear <laughs> due to the green screen. But it's a nice little rig, and uh, boy, really proud to have it. You know, you're going to have to edit that out when we don't green screen in anything back there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it'll be all right. Um, we got a special show coming up next month. Next month? Next month. Not this month. We, we, it's a special show tonight, too. <laughs> They're all special. Oh, it's just more yeah. special. Yeah. Let's it's, get that settled now. They are all special. Each one is a special. <laughs> Now, what what do you think it is, Tommy? I know what it is. What is it? It's our seventh anniversary, man. It's hard to believe we've been doing this for seven years. It is. You're joking. Seems like eight. <laughs> <laughs> no. no I, I'm serious. I didn't know. It's seven years? Seven years next month. Wow. wow. 17 Peter, years. how long have you been on board with I us? think I came in after episode 12. You've been on a bit of a hiatus, so that's probably five years for me. Still pretty significant. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it is. So that means uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Well, uh, it, yeah, we were, do it we were doing it. When we we were, were, yeah, yeah, we were shooting. It didn't get released until after the hurricane because, yeah. uh, well... Yeah. We had a hurricane and, yeah. and no power or anything, but we were shooting just immediately before it because when we were out there at the Wi-Fi site, the wind was blowing real hard. Yeah. And that that was the wind. Yeah, we, wow. were make, we made note of the, there's a hurricane out in the Gulf, I think. Speaking of, uh, we actually uh, said speaking of hurricanes, sure. uh, I've heard you've had a hurricane over there, I think Hurricane Isaac. Yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, Mill is going to be in a little bit later. And he's talk going to a give us bit. a report on that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, let's get on into the show. Oh, one other thing, we've got a very special announcement coming up a little later in the show as well. So, you do want to stay tuned. In other words, when it comes up to my segment, don't don't skip past it. Or same thing with Jim's or Tommy's <laughs> or Peter's, because you might miss it. And you no, you can skip past mine. Don't yeah, worry about it. You're really going to want to hear this. So Yeah, that's a good one. Well, in staying with our theme of emails for everything, every show, I've got a special one this week from Tom. Now, now are you sure it's special? <laughs> it is. I guarantee you it's special. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to get <clears throat> clarification Everything is special, yeah. Jim. <laughs> Uh, this comes from Tom, KM5H, and he says, I'm really anxious to see what you have in mind for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I use mine to keep DX Maps on and have its very own screen so that I can watch 6-meter propagation. But it could do so much more. What do you think, Tommy? Yeah, man, it's unlimited. That's a pretty it good is. use right there. It really is. And uh, I've been hearing people talking about a lot of different things that they've done actually got an email covering uh, one of them. That thing's just wide open. Yeah, I'm still know. still waiting for somebody to compile that echo link for it, yeah. so I don't have to. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it's a neat little device still. 35 bucks. go out and grab yourself one. By the way, I think they are getting close to releasing Revision 2. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they yeah. are. It's actually, uh, I read that uh, the Version 2 boards are actually beginning to roll out and turn up in uh, consumers' hands. Yeah. And what's the difference? Um, it was minor differences. I don't Mounting remember. Mounting holes yep. in the um, board. That's a good one. Which it's, I will talk yeah. about a little later in the yeah. show. Nothing significant as far as uh, you know, circuit changes. Yeah, they say that uh, don't hold off and wait on version yeah. 2 because the changes are so minor that... Uh, you yeah. know, there, there's no real reason to wait. Well, the mounting holes were a little bit of a disappointment for me because I actually had a 
case I wanted to put it in. But well, I will show you how here in just a few minutes you can you can do that without the holes. All right, that'll work. Yeah, Jim, what have you got over there? I've got a special email. A special one. A special one, and it's from our friend Carlos KT7CA. And Carlos says, hey, he discovered us a few months ago, and he wants to say thank you for the time and dedication that we put into it. You're welcome, Carlos. He's been a ham for many years, and he says he's really glad to see simple and educational material for our hobby. He says it's more than a hobby, really. But, and this is the part that impresses me, uh, he even felt comfortable showing it to his 11-year-old daughter, who got her last license last year, and she even now asks him, when is the next program coming up? Okay. Awesome. I, I wish my uh, kids were that interested. <laughs> but, yeah, me too. Especially you know, at age 11. When, when Dad does it, it's not special. Yeah, it takes sometimes. all the coolness like, out. Like everything else on the show. Yeah, so. exactly, yeah. <laughs> Tommy, <laughs> what have you got over there? And I have an extra special email. Oh, it's from extra uh, special. Extra special. Yeah. This is from our friend Bill, KE4WKP. says he has an idea for a future segment. He hasn't yet taken the plunge into D-Star, but he's somewhat interested. I thought maybe a little segment on how it works. I've seen these DV dongle things on Ham Nation before, and I don't really know what it does or how it works. Just a thought. This could be on Amateur Logic or Ham Nation. I'm just curious. I have no clue on how this all works. So anyway, uh, I did one on the DV access point last mm -hmm. month, and I'm working on getting a DV dongle in my hands, and I think we should have one very soon, so stay tuned, and uh, you should see what you're asking for. Check out episode 42. Yeah. And speaking of D-Star, what have you got for us as a special segment this And I've got a special, <laughs> it's, just, it's special, it might be even be a little borderline on extra special, but... Uh, Anyway, I got a new toy. Well, it looks like Christmas time here in the N5ZNO household. I've got a nice shiny ICOM 2820H rig here. This is like the Cadillac of uh, UHF, VHF uh, mobile rigs. I'm really excited to put this thing in my truck. Along with the radio, I got the UT123, which gives it D-Star capability. Of course, we all got to have that now, right? Uh, anyway, I, I do. It's kind of a necessity for me these days. It feels like it. Anyway, this, uh, like I mentioned, it's a dual band, dual watch, UHF, VHF radio. <clears throat> it's got a nice big display on it, so my old eyes uh, should be easy to see. The digital board, the UT123 here, it's, gives the radio D-Star capability, and there's also a GPS antenna with it, uh, built-in GPS in the board. So that should be fun to have DPRS in my mobile. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to playing with this stuff. Well, there's several things in the box. We've got the chassis of the radio. It's got the cooling fan, all that good stuff on it. We've got the remote head, which is really nice. Like I said, I love the display. It's huge. It should make it really easy for my on my eyes. In my vehicle right now, I have a Yesu 857D, and I'll be honest, it's a little bit difficult to see for, at times. Um, one of the nice things about this remote head is there are magnets on the back of it. So this should make mounting it really easy. And then it comes with the usual ICOM multifunction microphone. Uh, this one is the HM133, which I think comes on most of their rigs, or quite a few of them anyway. Um, anyway, you can control pretty much everything on the radio with this mic. It also came with a short cable and a long extension cable to connect the remote head to the to the chassis. Let's put the uh, D-Star board in. Uh, that should be pretty easy. It looks like we've got to remove 10 screws from the chassis and then just plug the board in along with a few little screws to hold it in place. Let's take a look at that. Well, taking the last screw out here, Well, the board just plugs right in the slot right here, and it's really easy. And then there's three set screws to hold it in place. So let's put those in.
Well, I took the liberty of mounting the bracket onto this old piece of wood I have just so the radio will be sturdy. Can't tell you how many radios I've had mounted to this piece of wood over the years. On the radio, we've got some connectors I'd like to show you. We've got the one for the mic. We've got the one to hook up the remote head or the controller as it's labeled. We've got the GPS antenna and there's a data jack on here as well. And then if you'll see these small indentions right here, those match up with the magnets I was telling you about a few moments ago. And it just kind of snaps together like that. So I'll go ahead and cook, hook up the, uh, the head to the chassis here. And um, one thing of note, this cable is not the same on both sides. So be careful which way you hook it up. Well, it'll actually only go one way. But then anyway, just take notice as you're plugging it up. So it routes out through here on the side and turns around and loops back into the side of the uh, of the remote head here. The microphone plugs in under here as well. Just route the cables right out of the side right there. Hook this one in the side here. I've already got a nice shiny PL259 here ready to plug in. Now, here's something that kind of caught me off guard. What I was because I wasn't expecting it. If you take a close look at the back of the radio, we've actually got two connectors for antennas here. What's that all about? One is actually the transmit and receive antenna and the other one is receive only so this this radio actually has a diversity receive setup which can be enabled in the menus to help get rid of picket fencing and and dead spots um, it, it will uh, actually use the stronger signal of the two I'm, I'm sure as you've used a handy talkie before you've noticed that if you put the handy talkie in one spot you may not be able to hear the repeater well you can move it over a few inches or foot and get it full quieting so this this kind of works the same way in your mobile rig this will kind of help alleviate that that issue as you're traveling it's a very nice feature um, i've got two antenna connections on my truck i actually plan on taking advantage of this so i'll report back a little bit later on to see how it works for me well let's see what we've got Before we do anything with D-Star, we need to enter our call sign. This is displayed on the uh, the last heard log in the control panel for the repeaters. It's really easy. Just follow the instructions. Uh, CLR erases the character. ABC gives you alphanumeric. 1, 2 is numeric and back when you're finished. Very straightforward. As you can see, I've already put several frequencies in here, my usual ones. It's, it's really straightforward to put a frequency in. All you've got to do is go to the VFO, enter what, oops, sorry, enter what you want, and when you get ready to save it, hold down the memory recall button, and it'll start flashing select memory right when you get ready to to uh, save it. Let's just give a quick overview of the radio itself. You've got independent volumes for each band. I love that. Separate squelches behind each of the uh, volume knobs. We've got independent tuning for either band. To change bands, you can see you've got main on the left. If you want to use the one on the right, push the control knob for the frequency here and you can change it as well. You don't have to have selection to either 
to change them. The function key brings up the menu system and you've got a few layers deep of uh, menus that you can go through. You've got quite a few buried in there as well. So first thing we do is go in and set our call sign memory. Uh, you can set a DV message, transmit message memory, and I've got a couple in here. I've just got my name and then I've got Tommy2820H. Just playing around with it for now. You can do voice memos, set different scan modes for it. This, this radio has got so many features, it's going to be impossible to even cover, scratch the surface of them in the 10 minutes that I have for this segment. So this, uh, there's a lot of things. You can change the mode. Each, uh, each band has individual. You can change the mode to FM narrow, AM, AM narrow, digital voice, or FM. To get out of the menu system, tap the function key again. It's uh, it's your standard operation. The function is a little bit different than some of the Kenwoods and the Yesus that I've had in the past. This is actually my first ICOM mobile rig, and I'm I'm really proud of this one. It will, I'm sure it will not be my last one. You can change this also to show one band or the other. So you can hit the function, hit single, and make the display literally huge um anybody could see that thing man this uh even i could see that from a pretty good distance so we'll go back to dual mode which is what i like i've had a lot of questions about can it cross band repeat sure it can let's let's give it a try and see how it works we'll set up a vhf on the left a uhf on the right to get it to go into cross band mode it's really easy just hold both of the channel knobs down and the function at the same time and you will see the key in the top right start to blink so let's get my little handy talkie out here and let's give it a try I'll flip over here to my simplex channel I'm on FM just like this and let's give it a whirl N5 Z and O so you can see I transmitted th this channel on my handy talkie. Oops, this watch is a little low. Transmitted through here on my handy talkie, it was received and retransmitted on my two meter frequency. Next question was, will it cross band D star? And actually it, it will. It wasn't quite as easy to put together as I thought, but the functionality is there. Let's turn off crossband repeat by holding down the function key till the blinking key lock goes away. And I'm going to pick a UHF D star frequency. Uh, there's our local K5RKN repeater. And I will use my D star simplex frequency that I normally use 146500. That's the one I use with my DV access point. And you can see it mutes one side. You can't listen to two D star channels at the same time. So what we're going to do here is we're going to set both of these to FM. You can see right now they're on digital voice. So let's go to mode. Uh, tap the function key. Bring up mode. Change that to FM. We'll go to this side. Do the same thing. And let's get out of that. The next thing we'll do is turn down the volume because this is really uh, not a pleasant sound to hear when you hear all this digital traffic going across the air. We turn back on crossband, same way. Key starts blinking. So let's get our handy talkie out. And we're going to go down here to my simplex channel again. If you notice, I don't really have it set to simplex right now. I said have it set to duplex. So there's a negative offset. What we're going to do is go in here to duplex and tone, offset frequency, set the offset to zero. Go back out. And all we've got to do now is 
use the handy talkie the normal way. The radio will, will pick up the data from the handy talkie, pass it through the radio onto the over the air and to the repeater. So let's see if we can get into the K5RKN repeater. N5ZNO testing. And you can see here that we were picked up by the repeater. A few things I haven't mentioned. The power levels 5, 15, and 50 watts, they're independent on either band on either side of the radio, so you, you can change them separately. Um, the audio reports have been great. Have Nobody's complained at all about low audio, distorted audio, thin audio. Everyone says they sound good on D-Star and on analog. Great radio so far. I'm looking forward to using it for a lot of years. I'm going to mount it in my truck hopefully this weekend. Maybe I can get some footage and show you the install. Get DPRS working in my truck. I've played with DPRS with my handy talkie and the GPS mic, but it's going to add a new dimension to, to it for me, um, having it in my truck all the time. So I'm looking forward to playing with that stuff. Anyway, I'll keep you informed on things that I find. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, tommy at amateurlogic.tv. Uh, drop me a line on Twitter, at amateurlogic, or on our Facebook group. Um, anyway, 73, and hopefully I'll talk to you on the radio soon. That's a really special looking rig. It is special. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. I mean, I, I use the ID880H here. And it's a nice rig, but boy, this 2820, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's nice, man. It's a, and, I'm yeah. sorry. It's a catch me out. There's no question. Yeah, well, I actually used your phrase, the uh, Cadillac, and, uh, in my segment. It's it's true. It's a really nice rig. It's it probably really the nicest is. one I've had. The the one thing I like the most about it is I can cross band D Star with it. Yeah, I, I noticed that in, the, in, in your segment. That's wild. I did not know you could yeah. do that with it. Well, Peter, what have you got going on down there? Wait, 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 wait. Let me guess. You got a special something. Okay. Oh well, I've got a few emails here. <laughs> you completely threw me there. Right? Um, They're all special, right? Mm, oh, they are indeed. Yeah, we do. We do like the uh, the feedback from our viewers. Okay, I've got an email here from Todd in Denver, <laughs> and it's a lengthy email. But to summarise it, basically, he's interested in creating a few Roku channels. Um, he's uh, uh, he found our channel through uh, the uh, the Roku. And he asks about uh, uh, how, uh, how uh, who created it for us and uh, uh, how they went about uh, uh, about creating the channel. Well, I actually did it myself. Uh, I you go to the Roku website and you register as a developer and download the developer's kit. Uh, included in there is a few sample, uh, uh, shall we say, channels that you, uh, that you can modify for your own purposes. And what I did was I used that and also uh, looked around on the internet for some guides as to uh, how to create uh, a channel. It's a bit complex, uh, uh, so uh, but uh, by all means, uh, have a look. And, uh, you know, well, you, uh, it shouldn't be too hard to actually create a simple uh, video uh, player channel, uh, just if you've got a few videos on the internet. Uh, oh, he's, and the other, other thing, sorry, he mentions that his dad was a CB long before the 10-4 Good Buddy era and wanted to be a ham but could never work a key well enough. Well, the good news is these days you don't need Morse code to, to become a ham, so uh, we'd encourage anybody who's interested to uh, uh, contact your local club and uh, sit the test. Well, 10-4 there, Peter. <laughs> oh, yeah, Good Buddy. Oh. Are you guys ex-CBers like myself? Yeah, well, actually, you know. my dad was a CB before there were, you know, Channel 19 and all that stuff, too. So, yeah, I used to go out and sit in the Ford Bronco I was 19, a 69 was, model. I thought was there a, was always a Channel 19 on CB. Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> I was actually a pirate CB at 12, so I come from a, uh, I had a bad upbringing. <laughs> 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 that explains a lot, Peter. <laughs> well, I've got a... a poll here to talk about. You know, on the Amateur Logic Facebook group, we've been running a poll about the Raspberry Pi since... Uh, Don't you mean a special poll? <laughs> no, this one's not special. <laughs> oh, it's not? No, it's only the on the show tonight that's not special. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> anyway, we asked the question. Uh, we said the Raspberry Pi is a hot new $35 Linux computer that runs reasonably well. We've already shown it a few times. Would you like to see more? 
And there were three choices that you could answer here. Number one was make raspberry pie projects a regular part of the menu. Number two was serve some pie occasionally. And number three was I don't like pie. So oh. how do you think it turned out? Well, who's going to vote for I don't like pie? I mean, oh my well, gosh. That's two, two people. Two people do not like the raspberry pie, and that's that's fine. I mean, it's not for what, everybody. What's your theory on people not liking pie, Peter? I think they uh, may have a gluten intolerance. <laughs> uh, could be. Could be. Uh, number two. Either that or they didn't see Peter's segment or any, you know, George's yeah. segment or any, any of our segments. Serve some pie occasionally had 29 votes. So that's a lot more than two. So, so, so people are interested in 20, it. 29,000 votes for number no, two? No, just huh? 29. Oh, just 29. 29. I'll tell you oh, what's special. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the number one response was make raspberry pie project a regular part of the menu. 68 people say do that. 68. So that's the majority. No, just 68. It's not special. You know, I would expect a lot more votes than that. I I would have too, but, uh, you know, that's what we got. And uh, Well, it's only been on there for what? A day? Two days? No, no, it's been on there longer than that. Longer than that. Jim does not check the Facebook page regularly. I check it every day. Yeah, and the poll's still (laughs) open, right? So they can still go state their pie preference. Yeah, You, you can still go vote. So... Over half the people say make it a regular part of the show, which is good because (laughs) here's my segment for this week. For several weeks now, I've been playing around with my raspberry pie on the bench here, and I've been fortunate enough that I haven't damaged it or shorted anything out yet, but that's not going to last forever. So today, I'm going to build a case to put it in, and in keeping with the spirit of the pie, I want to make this as cheap as possible. So I went back to Lowe's and I bought a plastic electrical box that was only three or four bucks for the box and the lid to it. And that's what I'm going to mount my pie in. Now I decided the best way to measure this and to cut it would be to sit the board down in there. Now there are several connectors we need to be concerned with. There's the land connector right there and we'll cut a slot out for it in the corner and it'll protrude through the outside. There's the HDMI connector. There's a power connector on the end here, which is a micro USB. And under the bottom of the board, you can't see it here, but that's where the SD card fits in, so I'll need to cut a slot for that. Over here are the USB ports, and I'll cut a hole for them there. Now, up on top is the audio and the composite video output. I probably won't use a composite video on this, So I'm not going to worry about it at the moment. For the audio, I believe I'll just plug a plug in to the jack and run a small wire to the outside where I'll mount an external jack on the case. And that'll be my audio output. Now I think I'd probably be best to cut a hole for the LAN connector first and then position the board. So I'll mark it on the case here so I know where to cut. And now I'm going to go back out to the old shack, which I still have, and is now my, I I guess you'd call it a machine shop or a woodworking shop. Now I think the Dremel might be the best tool to cut out this plastic, so I'll use that and we'll cut out the slots here for the land connector. I'm going to use a cutoff wheel that's designed for cutting plastic. Now I'll take my X-Acto saw and trim the little corners out, and it should pop right out of there. Next, I'll use an X-Acto knife, and we'll trim up the rough edges on here. Now we can see exactly where the board's going to fit. So next, I'll take my Sharpie and make some marks around the USB connectors so that we can cut out for them. Now I'll take a drill and drill in the corners of the marks I made for the USB connectors so I can see on the outside of the box where they need to be. And then I'll use a straight edge and a square to kind of square up that hole. And to cut this one, I don't think it'll be possible with the Dremel tool, so I'm going to pull out something I haven't used in a while, which is a homemade hot knife attachment. This is 
simply a big piece of copper wire that I cut a slit in and put an X-Acto blade into. And as I began using it, I found that uh, actually it worked better and cut better than I thought it would, and a little quicker too. Not this quick, but I just tapped it and the piece fell right out. Now, you see I've got a little spacer in there between the LAN connector and the USB connector. I eventually ended up cutting that out because it was going to be such a tight fit. The hot knife worked so good that I ended up using it for cutting all the rest of the holes and slots into the case. And that took, oh, maybe an hour or so to get them right and get them trimmed up. And then it was back into the main shop studio. The first thing I did was cut the hole and made the cable so we could extend the audio connector to the outside. Now you can see where I've cut here for the USB connector and the LAN connector. On the side there you saw the HDMI connector. And here's a slot for the power and the memory card. Now it's not as neat as some of those cases that you would buy off the internet. However, this one was only four bucks and I made it myself. It looks like the pie is going to fit in there just fine. Now there's no holes in the corner of this that you can put screws and standoffs through to mount it. So I studied on it a little bit and I decided the best method probably to mount this would just be to use a hot glue gun and I'll put a little hot glue in each corner being careful not to get on any connectors and then set it down in there like that. And that worked out great. So now I put the top on the box and I went on the internet and downloaded a Raspberry Pi logo printed that out on a color laser printer. I took a little semi-gloss lacquer and sprayed over that to protect the label and then used some scotch spray adhesive to attach the label to the case. And now I think that's a pretty neat looking little $4 Raspberry Pi tower case. And there's a little extra room inside. What am I going to do with that? You'll find out eventually. Man, you and Emil must shop at the same place. Oh, we do, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, dirt cheap. Yeah, that's a good, it's a nice case. It's a good idea. Yeah, and it's cheap too, we built. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's this project you're hinting on about uh, for the with the empty space in the case, uh, George? Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> it's uh, special, Peter. Uh, it's, it's not secret. finished. Uh. <laughs> I don't want to say too much till I know it works. Jim? Oh. Well, let's take a little uh, further adventure into Linux land, if you will with, uh, I can't say email, because it's actually something posted on our Facebook group from... The, the group that Jim doesn't visit much. From Rod. <laughs> and uh, Rod, Rod uh, I didn't leave his call sign, so maybe he doesn't have one yet, or maybe so. Well, I guess he does. Yeah, maybe Facebook really doesn't have yeah, one unless you stick it Yeah, just doesn't put them up name. there, yeah. yeah. So sure. anyway, Rod says, Linux Techs, help please. He's never been much of a Windows fan, but for the sake of... HRD, which is a fantastic program in his opinion. A lot of others, too. Rod. That's Ham Radio Deluxe, right? Yeah, Ham that's Radio correct. Deluxe. And he says, so, therefore, you know, he's been reluctant to switch over to Linux. So the other day, he said, what the heck? He's taken the dive. He went with Ubuntu 12.04, good distribution. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's quite pleased with the OS so far, he said. So now that he's over there, he's looking for help. Uh, what program, he wants to know, on the Linux side of life is equal to HRD, or what program can he use to emulate HRD in Ubuntu? And now, uh, might note that uh, Jonathan from our group jumped back on there with Rod and said he uses FL Digi, and that it works really well for him, and that he could also recommend a, a Yahoo group called Linux Ham. Very, uh, very good answers. Oh, yeah, and Art jumped on there and said, uh, FL Digi is good, and you should, if you want the latest, go get the binary direct from their site. Uh, all good answers, and absolutely, FL Digi is a great program. The unfortunate part is it only emulates or is comparable to uh, Digital Master 780, mm -hmm. the uh, Ham Radio Deluxe digital portion. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's nothing on the Linux side of life that 
even comes close to not, being not a single program anyway. yeah yeah as nice as ham radio deluxe as far as just operating your rig and really there's there's really not that many really almost any linux programs that do a really decent job of allowing you to control your rig the way ham radio deluxe allows you to control it if I had to recommend one, I would say look at G Rig, or I guess you could call it Grig. It's spelled G R I G. Check that one. Jimmy, okay. uh, quick question: Do you think it'd be possible to port G Rig to the Raspberry Pi? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, it's only dependent on one library, and so yeah, more than possible. Oh, okay. Yeah, good information. Nice project. Yeah. Tommy, let's talk a little bit about mobile antennas. Let's do. <clears throat> I have a, uh, an email. What kind of email is it, Jim? A special it's email. A, it's actually a Facebook post. Okay. It's from our friend David. He says, how bad would using Loctite on mobile antenna parts be? Typically the set screws for tuning and mounting to the base. Yeah, um, I remember this. this yeah, there was, a, there was a mixed bag of... Uh, of uh, replies down there and who responded on this you one? you did on one of them anyway actually you said it was a mixed bag mixed response but uh anyway um said so qst column recommends it for set screws and such and uh anyway there's several that said do it several that say don't I, there's different grades of uh lot type mm -hmm. i use the blue a lot on things i haven't ever put it on an antenna personally i don't think it's probably too bad to put a dab of it on the set screws, but I would keep it away from the NMO mount or any place yeah. where the electrical connections are. You know, I've had uh, two-way radio antennas on cars since 1974. Mm -hmm. I've never used Loctite, and I've never had a whip fall out yet, so I'm not sure why you would need it, but uh, I, I guess you could use a little dab of it. I never had a whip fall out until this year. My, my Stinger fell out of my ATAS 120A antenna. Huh. I don't know how, but it came out. Wow. I've never lost one and I've never used it, but I, as I mentioned on there, I have read where a lot of people use it, and I guess it's probably a good idea. Tommy, you reckon it was some thief with an Allen wrench and he just didn't get finished? Could have been, man. Mm. Uh. <laughs> Peter? What have you got next on your <laughs> stack of pile there? A stack Another, of emails. How's that stack of pile? <laughs> Another email here, and this one's from Mike, and he had a few questions, so I'll quickly run through them. First, is the internal antenna in most USB Wi-Fi received dongles always on the end opposite the USB connector? In short, in my experience, yes. Uh, question two, is there any diameter limits to the wok dish used? Um... The answer is, again, uh, well, in, in this case, uh, no. Uh, if, if you can get a big enough wok, um, you can turn it into a parabolic antenna. It's just a matter of uh, working out where the focal point is. Speaking of which, question three is, is there a simple way to determine the wok dish's focal point? Now, I've sent a, uh, an email to George, which hopefully will be appearing at the bottom of your screen. Uh, not an email, a, a, sorry, a web address. And uh, that, uh, uh, that's to a New Zealand website, a chap called Stan Swan, uh, who runs an extensive site uh, uh, which all deals all with uh, making wok dishes. And uh, his, the formula is contained there. But just uh, off the top of my head, it's, um, let's see, the diameter squared divided by 16 times the depth of the dish. And um, that, that, uh, that will give you uh, where to uh, put the focal point. Okay. Well done, Peter. Speaking of antennas. That was special. Take a look at this picture here. <laughs> yes, it's a special <laughs> antenna, Jim. <laughs> uh, this came from Facebook, and uh, Donnie, he says, Do you know why this antenna has vertical and horizontal elements? What was it used for? I had to take it down at a site I have a repeater at. Strange, I've seen two more like these at different radio sites on the south side of Chicago. There was no transmitter there. Um, oh, I know. It was going to fall, so I asked if I could remove it. 
and have it. And uh, thanks for looking at it. So that is uh, an interesting looking antenna there for sure. What do you think it is, Jim? Because it's a special antenna. <laughs> okay, I, I think we've about used up all our special I'm sorry. sauce. I'm sorry, I couldn't. <laughs> couldn't. Special sauce. Yeah. Couldn't resist. Yeah. Now, that, I would say my honest guess would be because it's uh, they're trying to achieve circular polarization. Yeah, which it really wouldn't be circular. It'd be similar. It'd be yeah. vertical and horizontal polarization. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if there were two feed lines coming down from here or not. It could be, um, you know, because if, if you've got a vertically polarized antenna, it's going to be best received by another vertically polarized antenna. And the same thing if they're both horizontal, right. they're going to do better. It might be these are multiple sites that talk to each other, and uh, maybe the vertical elements are used to communicate with cars, and the horizontal elements are used to link these sites could together. Be. No telling, but <clears throat> if any of you have an idea of what this antenna could possibly be, uh, let us know at the Facebook group there. I'll yeah. tell you the first thing that crossed my mind when I saw it. I thought it was an entry in the strange antenna challenge we saw last month. Ah, could be. It's, I've never seen one quite like that. Yeah, well, let's let's stay on antennas for a little bit. Jim? Okay. What are you doing this week? Well, as a matter of fact, a lot of antenna work. Go tell Mama. Go tell the kids. Jim's got the torch out again. It should be entertaining. <laughs> There's one thing about building a delta loop for 80 meters. You need wire, lots of it. And what we're gonna talk about today is how to cope if you don't have a piece of wire that's long enough for an 80 meter delta loop. In particularly, we're gonna do some wire splicing. Whew, yep, a lot of wire. In fact, Let's pull out my handy dandy iPhone calculator here and talk about how much wire an 80 meter delta loop requires. The formula for an 80 meter delta loop is 1005 divided by the frequency in megahertz. So they are wideband antennas, but I'm going to cut mine for 3.8 megahertz uh, simply because um, it's right above the DX window and uh, that's really the primary reason I'm building an 80 meter delta loop. So that calculates out to 264 and call it a half feet. It's actually 264.473. So with that in mind, so let's talk about how we're going to splice this wire together. What's the best way to splice wire together? Well, I don't know. But I know how I'm going to do it. So I'm not going to suggest that this is best practices. I'm just going to say this is the way Jim does it. If it works for you, good. If it doesn't, I'm sorry. And if you've got a better way, by all means, uh, email us, uh, jimmy at amateurlogic.tv, uh, or send us a video even of uh, what you think would be a good way. I strip a, a good long section. Since this wire has a really good patina on it, I'm going to see if our 220 grit sandpaper here will take uh, most of that off so that we can get a really good uh, connection and solder job. Okay, that's probably good enough. Got our wire nice and shiny now. I take about half the length and began twisting it around each other. And then, take some uh, solder flux. Let's see. 
Where'd my lighter go? Time to light the torch. Heat our wire and the magic begins to happen. Couple of gotchas to watch out for. <laughs> Don't let your solder get too short. <laughs> or else you'll be soldering your fingers to the wire instead of. Uh... <laughs> okay. Snip off the protrusions, prevent hanging in the trees, and you're good to go. You're ready for the next one. Okay. That's not something you want to have happen. I don't know what it is exactly about me and torches, but something always seems to not work out. So now it's off to the tower site with our torch to bring the ends of our loop together and solder on our pigtail. As you can see, I'm using a small plastic plate that I robbed off of an old piece of gear and put some holes in it to run the wire through. I like to snake the wire through two different holes which seems to hold it really well and a piece of plastic like this is very lightweight. Uh oh, hold on a second. I forgot something. Yeah, we uh, have to undo this in order to put it on too. You see this plastic pulley? It's very important. It's going to be part of support number two. You need two supports for a delta loop. And we'll talk more about that pulley in just a second. But we have to put it on or within the loop now or else we'll just have to cut the wire later and solder it back together. So we don't want to do that. Now, with our wire back in our plate, we simply solder our pigtail on and we're through with support number one. Now on to the tree, which is support number two, and here's that pulley I was telling you about. We simply put it onto our hoist rope, and voila, that's going to be support number two. And you'll see why it's important we have a pulley in just a moment. Okay, let's get up the tower and get support number one finished off. Now that we've got support one and support two finished off, there's only one thing left to do, and that's add our weight at the bottom. Here's a diagram showing what our antenna layout looks like, except the wire actually rides on the pulley, not, as it's shown in this picture, tied to the tree. We have our pulley tied to the tree, and the wire rides on the pulley. So we need to add a weight at the bottom of the delta loop and this will allow the antenna to um, not break as the tree flexes back and forth in high wind conditions. The wire will simply ride back and forth over the pulley and lift the weight up and down. You can use anything you like for a weight. I would suggest something in the one to two pound category. And I suppose now that just leaves one question. You know, I've used an 80 meter loop here for a number of years, Jim, and, and I really like it. It looks like you maybe hung yours up vertically. Yeah, where, yeah, I did. Where mine is horizontally. So mine would be the top half of that antenna that we were just looking at, and yours would be the bottom half. But okay, the obvious question okay. how does it play? The, the answer is like every other antenna, you have to judge it over time to really get a good idea. So far, though, I like what I see. Now, I will say that the pans have been 
in terrible condition this past week, which is how long I've had it up and working. So, you know, I, I'm hoping that although I'm pleased with it now, I'm hoping that I'm really going to be very pleased with it after it's all said and done. But I can't say that for sure yet. Now, I noticed you had a 80 meter loop formula listed there on the segment. Yes. Will that formula work for the other bands as well? Uh, for a loop, yes, it will. Okay. And one more question. Okay. I'm full of questions today. All right. But here's a special one. A special question? <laughs> I thought the special sauce was... Uh, yeah. What kind of flux and solder was that you were using? Was that rosin core or was that acid core? No, it was absolutely rosin core. It was. Yeah. Okay. One of the first things you taught me was never, ever... Not even if your grandmother's dying, don't ever use acid core flux. Granny would hate you for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, keeping with our special theme, we've got a special announcement here. You know, next month will be the seventh anniversary of AmateurLogic.tv. Wow. And, you know, we ought to do something a little different. What do you think we ought to do, Tommy? Let's have a giveaway. Why don't we? What, what do you think we ought to give away, Jim? Uh, how about a complete amateur outfit? An HF outfit. Close. An let's, let's HF do that. outfit. Yeah. I like it. Let's see. Um, and let's give it to me. No, you can't oh, no. have it. <laughs> oh. um, i tell you what, why don't we give away an ICOM IC7200? How would that be with you guys? I'd love oh, to have yeah. one. <laughs> what do you think, Peter? I think that would be an excellent uh, giveaway. You know, but they can't use a radio by itself, so... Let's find some other stuff mm. to go with it. Let's see if we can come up with an antenna tuner. A tuner? Um, let's see. How about an have antenna to hook hooked to the tuner? An antenna. There an you go. Yeah. There Tommy's you go. thinking. Jimmy's got an 80 meter delta loop yeah. over there. <laughs> what else will we need with that, Peter? Um, let's see. Probably some coax. Yep. Oh, well. Yeah. I wish you wouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't in the plants. Maybe Not much we can come up with some coax. <laughs> Maybe we can find no. some. But well, if we're not, come up with as much of the amateur radio setup as we can find. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can come up with a power supply. Ah, That's yes. That's a good possibility. Mm -hmm. You've yeah, got to useful. have a power supply. Absolutely. So anyway, wow. why don't you be checking out the AmateurLogic.tv Facebook group this month and watch as this contest develops. It'll be the seventh anniversary of AmateurLogic.tv, and it'll be the HF station giveaway, uh, courtesy of ICOM. And whoever else we get to participate in the contest. And I, I know we've got a couple other manufacturers we're talking with right now. So that's going to make somebody a great setup there. Wow, it really will. It'll be simple to enter. Um, it will not be a popularity contest. We'll, we'll have the details on there on how we're going to sort out who actually wins this. Uh, some lucky ham is going to get a nice setup there. Yeah. So let's be clear. We're going to give it away on the next show, right? Yeah, and it won't be to one of us. Yep. That was yeah. my next question. No, we will not give it away on the next show. We will start the contest on the next start show. Start the contest. Okay, just yeah. want to make sure it's clear. But if you want some preliminary information and want to go ahead and get registered in the contest, we'll be posting something about that this month. So check our Facebook yeah. page. Yeah, and, and you'll learn more of uh, you know what we're, we're actually going to be giving away there. So continuing on here, Jim, have you got one final email for us there? Uh, as a matter of fact, yes. And it is a learned email from our friend Charlie, KY5U. Charlie, very interesting uh, situation. He has made a ham university. Yeah, he actually calls it KY5 University because his call is KY5U, so it's just like an extension of the call there. So, uh, yeah, very cool. Uh, I had actually gone out and looked at Charlie's site before he sent us this email, and it must have been uh, in the days when it was in really preliminary early stages. He still says that it's under development, but that we can go and check it out. And here's that URL, uh, http colon whack whack u dot ky5 u dot net. And it's super cool. You can go on there and you can click on controls or you can click anything that you see in the little carousel there and then it brings up a bigger picture. And so like if you bring up the ham rig, you can click on the controls 
and see what everything on the ham rig does. It's a great learning environment. I think I'll check that out when we leave here because there's a couple of knobs on mine. I don't know what they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, let's talk a little more about D-Star. This is from our friend Don, VK7YXX. Anyway, he says he noticed in the last Amateur Logic that we were looking for amateur radio uh, Raspberry Pi projects. Although not a smoke and solder type project in the classic sense, I um, thought we might be interested in a D-Star project that uses Raspberry Pi. Well, he, he caught my attention right off the bat with that one. Yeah. So in, he says he's currently running a D-Star repeater that's controlled by a Raspberry Pi. The re this repeater is proof that you can set up a D-Star repeater relatively cheaply. Uh, it uses a German DVRPTR board controlled by a Raspberry Pi via USB along with a Frencom FC301D for receive in an ICOM 880H for transmit at 50 watts. The repeater operates full duplex mode using the cheap Chinese UHF duplexer, <clears throat> excuse me, with no decent issues in a relatively RF quiet location, of course. Anyway, it says uses the uh, Raspbian Wheezy distribution and the DVRPTR controller and IRC DDB gateway software developed by. Jonathan Naylor, G4KLX. For more information, go look under the news section on his site at www.vk7rrr.info. Uh, anyway, I took a look at it. It's uh, pretty impressive. That's basically the same stuff that our friend Johnny does over in Clinton. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. He's using the Raspberry Pi for his, though. It's, it's really nice. Go check out the link. Some cool yeah. stuff on there. Yeah, he's using a, a regular full-size Linux computer there but uh, yeah so lots of interesting things on D-Star there it is open source now I think I don't know if you call it proprietary or not the codec that's used to encode and decode the audio is only available on the chip so you can find those chips yeah, for but what, you can, 20 bucks you can buy the chip uh, from what I understand from like eight to eight to twenty five dollars depending yeah. on what you want so that, while the codec on the chip is proprietary you can get the chip easily so yeah yeah and you just have to know what to do with it once you get it mm -hmm. but there are a number of projects out there i think there's one from motronics um where some guys actually built a complete d-star rig themselves wow so uh some interesting things out there still kind of uh early in the days of this homebrew stuff at d-star but there are beginning to be a lot of gateways on now that uh you know, are, are using surplus equipment that people are cobbling together with these boards. And yeah, they're doing some amazing stuff. Some of them are experimenting with D-Star over HF. Um, wow. Of wow. Stuff. I yeah. didn't really know Really cool that. stuff. Yeah. Jim, you know, I'm just kind of in a cheap spirit today. <laughs> well, you're not the cheapest one. Speaking of that, we got Emil with us today. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Emil. Hello, hello. How are things down in South Louisiana? Well, Isaac uh, gave us a run for our money, and uh, we made it through, and uh, we have some tales to tell about it, and all kind of fun. We, but the most important thing is we made it through. We left, made it through. Left everything, or left, I guess you'd say everything, anything but cheap, huh, Emil? That's right. That's right. We have uh, lots of cheap tales to tell from this uh, experience. <laughs> yeah. So did you uh, have power throughout or did you lose electricity? We did lose electricity, George, uh, probably two days worth. And uh, actually some of my neighbors lost it for longer. So we turned our attention to uh, help the neighbors out. And that's part of some of the story uh, I have to tell, which we might have to do one day. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I assume you came out a lot better than you did uh, during the last big one to blow through. No doubt, no doubt, no comparison to Katrina. Uh, you know, the categories definitely make a difference and uh, some minor tree damage, no water, and uh, wind blew a lot of debris around. What have you got in the way of cheapness for us today? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's, a, there's a segment. The segment um, this time is on something I threw together when I was uh, scrambling for ways to distribute DC power throughout my shack. So uh, from my uh, my Astron power supply. So that's what this segment's about. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Cheap Old Man Minutes. In this episode, I wanted to show you a quick, easy, and of course cheap 
way to distribute your 12 volt sources in most situations in this case a quick and easy shack mounted or 2x4 mounted uh, terminal distribution there are only two pieces to this one is a 2x4 and two is the two terminal strips you see above and below the 2x4 they're bolted onto the side through the 2x4 taking a little bit of care to offset them a bit so that uh, the screws don't touch I did use long enough ones but uh, the uh, wood is also not the treated kind just in case that would have caused any troubles with the uh, conductivity but as you can see it's very simple and of course probably in this case under ten dollars so definitely worthy of a cheap old man minute so I've taken my Estron power supply and with a piece of leftover Romex I had from other projects I fed the two terminal strips the 12 volts and I've also taken care to label the negative and the positive terminals with marker just so I don't mess that up when uh, hooking up devices so with that I'll say 73 from KE5 QKR yeah I like that segment of meal that actually uh, kind of hit close to home with me I was removing some gear around in my shack this weekend and uh, come to find out that I need to come up with some way to distribute power I was hooking up an extra rig and it was kind of a hassle so, yeah. uh, I, I don't because on the back of my power supply I just got 49 wires hooked to each positive and 49 wires hooked to each, you know, hooked to the the negative post. So my power supply has just got, you know, oh, there you go. 98 well, wires. You must 49 have, on the positive and 49 on the negative. You must well, have like some car battery cable <laughs> ends on there. At, at least you don't have 49 on one and 48 on the other. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a great tip, Emil. And if you look behind my equipment rack over here, you'd see that I'm doing almost the same identical thing. Yeah. <laughs> it really works well. It really is a good idea, mm -hmm. Emil, and I expect I'll probably be looking much closer into that. Well, great to see you today, and we hope to have you back next month when you'll bring us something else cheap, I'm sure, <laughs> because it's going to be a special seventh anniversary amateur logic. Seven years. Wow. Man. No, I'll do it. Um, well, thanks, guys, and there's uh, plenty more cheap old man minutes where that came from. Join us on the Facebook AmateurLogic.tv group. Uh, join us on the AmateurLogic.tv uh, Google Plus group, too. And, and where Twitter, else? Twitter, at AmateurLogic. And where else, Jim? Oh, you can email us, Jimmy at AmateurLogic, George at AmateurLogic, Tommy at AmateurLogic.tv, Peter at AmateurLogic.tv. Yeah. And you might even hear us on the radio. You could. You could. I, I might actually get a chance to turn mine on this week. Boy, yes. I've been busy lately. And that brings up a good point. Well, the Amateur Logic Net will be the Monday, Monday? following the show release at 8.30. On That's the 17th. 17th this month on the, the Do Drop In Echo Link Conference Server. 8.30 Central Time. Well done. Yeah, it's star, do drop in, star, or node number 355800. 800. Well done. I'm going to get that on my arm, kind of like Don's. Like uh, Don's tattoo. tattoo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. 7-3, everyone. Catch you next month. 7-3. See you next Seven month. 7-3. Catch you later. Well, Jim, I'm feeling a little something cheap in the air tonight. Well, Jim, I'm just feeling a little cheap today myself. <laughs> Looking a little cheap. I mean, uh... <laughs>
Well, Jim, I smell something cheap. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't hold it. He couldn't hold it, Emil. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's wrong, man. 